We can go ahead and get started. Um, again, light up the chat if something is not working on Zoom, and we will figure that out. Okay. So, yeah. okay. Oh, yeah. All right. I think everybody's good. So, every week I, uh, I watch Penny's Labs and I always try to design my lab and make sure that, especially that's kind of reflecting what she wants you to know, it's going to reflect what's going to be on the test, too. And that's very important because I do want our lab section, obviously, to do the best among my other two lab sections, too. So just know that I do, yeah, I, I have your best interest in mind. I think goal is the philosophy that uh, lab should be a big food supplement. Okay, I'm going to go a little more. So when I am going through stuff, um, this is how I can, I usually kind of notate my slides. So anything in red is something that any pretty explicitly covered, like, you know, for example, passive transport is probably going to show up somewhere pretty significantly, like, that language, but that's something like kind of key into that. Blue is going to be something that's like, okay, this is happening within the systems that we're looking at. It's probably a level of detail you're not going to get tested on, but it is probably going to be helpful. So if you have answer, like, questions where you need multiple answers or something, blue is something like, hey, I can use this as an example for you. Double, double two. Green is where you can kind of relax. This is where we're going to talk about some interesting physiology, you know, human capabilities, things like that. Again, it's a good example, but it's nothing that's going to really show up in the test. You know, it's just something that you can apply to. So, with study questions, uh, this is something I call a gap strategy. So, study questions are great because these are the guiding questions that if you can answer all these without help, you're going to be fine on the exam. So, what I would do is kind of just follow the kind of the bullets I have there, go through these, and we can start right now. And you can do this right now, and you can do this all at home through a Zoom. Go through these right now and see which are the ones that you feel confident on, which are the ones you do not feel confident on. Take notes, like kind of note, and put those down, the ones that, hey, like, I am not all the way here yet, or like, hey, I'm really good on this already. Because once you narrow down all the things that you're not good on, that's when you come to me for questions, Penny for questions, or collaborate with each other, and figure those out, and you basically fill all those gaps so that when the exam comes, you have nothing left to Sometimes it feels like a lot, you know, there's study questions at each of these labs, but they are really good guides for what's going to show up on these exams. Lab exams, but also really the lecture ones, too. So use this kind of strategy. And again, that's what office hours are for. When you've identified the last, like, three or four questions that you're not cool on, that's when you can come to me, we'll figure them out, walk them through together. Okay. So we'll revisit these in a sec, but... I'm going to kind of go through everything that Penny went through in her lectures so that, you know, you're all as equally prepared as her labs are. So, starting off, this is diffusion. Everything, so even think of the air in this room, it is just expanding 50-50. Everything is about equally spaced, randomly, has random trajectories, everything. That's kind of the natural law of the universe is it will try to go towards 50-50, otherwise known as equilibrium. And if you... You give something no limit with which to expand, it will continuously just expand into disorder, entropy, for those of you that didn't black out chemistry, basically. So naturally, everything's going to want to go down this way. So if something starts 90% on one side and 10% on the other, that 90% is on the higher concentration gradient is going to flow downward. It's going to go towards that 10% area. So then everything eventually gets to 50. You're always going to see that thermodynamics wise, everything. Now, cells make this different. Every cell in the human body comes with a lipid bilayer, is what we call it. This is kind of why you need fats in your diet, is that these little chains right here, those are the fats. They make up the big circular border of all your cells. This is going to allow your cells not only just basic protection from stuff in their environment. It allows them to decide what comes in and what comes out. This is going to be the way that they can break 50 50 equilibrium rules. In this case, and what you'll see is that the edges of this bilayer are really hydrophilic. They like water. They're nice and polar. They're kind of semi charged. They're fine. The insides, these like those fatty chains that we talked about, they do not like water and they do not like anything that's charged. They're not allowed, they don't allow anything like that to come through. And then on the end, 
kind of have the reverse, like the same nice uh, temperature charge pad in gray there. And the big thing, again, yeah, I mean, you are really, this is nice for protection, but this is going to be what decides what comes in and out of the cell, and it kind of allows the cell to have its own world, to kind of have its own control of everything. This is a pretty, pretty large summary of what is allowed inside, back and forth in a cell, and what is not. There are two major rules that you'll see for things that are not allowed in. And you can always keep these two in mind if you ever have a question. Like if something comes on the test, is this molecule going to go through? You can ask yourself two things. Is it charged? And is it too big? If something's too big, it literally just won't fit through those lipids. Something has a big charge, like an ion, like a sodium, calcium, things like that. It cannot go through the membrane because the membrane is so uncharged that it repels it. Charged things like sand water are naturally much better in that environment. So if you're small and uncharged, like oxygen, for example, you pass freely, 50 50, total exchange, nothing, nothing in it. It's also why it's very, you know, this is why carbon monoxide, for example, is such a deadly poison. It can go right in, it can all your cells be wired to everything. Not a good time. But in a happier case, with oxygen, as your blood carries oxygen all around throughout your body, it's going to just freely pass right in. It doesn't need any kind of transporter, it doesn't need anything special. It's going to go right in. But anything else that's big? like glucose or proteins that you do need for yourself to thrive in some cases it's building blocks, but in more cases it's energy, they're not allowed just straight up in through the border. Yeah. So I shared um, kind of a study tool called the matrix on CGL. You can use them if there's a couple of couple of different ones. Um, it's basically just a way to compare different transport processes. So in this case, pure passive transport, facilitated and active are the three things that we're going to cover. You can kind of compare them through different categories. But just like a study tool, it's not like a worksheet or anything. So the first passive transport that you have is just like oxygen. That's straight up 50-50. It's just going to go right through. Nothing stops it. And that's going to be anything that, you know, again, is not charged and pretty small. Something is going to happen though. You need kind of an extra step. You need a facilitator to get in large molecules that your cells need. One of the large molecules that your cell needs a ton of is glucose. That's your energy. That's where you burn a lot. That's where you get a ton of energy for your body for all the functions that we're going to see. Glucose is way too big to just go through the membrane. So what it has to have is a specific transporter. And that is facilitated. All the transporter is going to do is serve as a gate, basically that basically serves as kind of like a channel through the membrane that allows the stuff to come through. Now the good thing about gate is it doesn't spend any energy. It's just going to allow 50-50 glucose from your bloodstream to go into the cell, let's say, and at least get to 50-50. So in this case, you'll have you'll at least have the glucose come down its concentration gradient. Because when you eat, for example, Pretty much all the glucose is outside in your, in your intestines, right? If you want to get that into your cells, so at least having the facilitated diffusion is going to allow 50 50 to come through. And it's these little protein channels right here. These are actually genes coded for in your DNA. Very specific. They're the, there's what's going to allow and be very specific to what comes in. You'll actually see that we can close these or open these depending on the scenario. Okay. In the case, though, of active transport, totally different than simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion, that now you are going to go against the concentration gradient. You are going to force things away from 50 50. This below here is showing a proton pump. All this is are just little hydrogen ions. All hydrogen ions actually are is basically just acid. The higher amount of hydrogen ions you have, the more acidic the environment. So in your gut, for example, where your body needs to rip apart and acidify everything you eat, you want 99.9% .9 of your hydrogen ion outside the cell ripping things apart. You don't want to have a 50-50. The way this happens is that there are pumps or other proteins that basically 
force these things out of the cell and don't allow them back in so that you can establish almost 90% of them outside the cell and kind of defy that 50-50. The key thing here is that you will need to spend chemical energy to do that. That is going to be the key difference with active transport, which is where your body actually has to spend some of the energy to sustain. Okay. This is just kind of a little like summary of where we're at. These are the main differences that you can have between these two things. Take a look here and make sure that you kind of understand why each one of these is kind of going to play the role that it plays in each of the processes and why it stands out as different. We'll apply these in a sec here. Okay. So, why is it, for example, that during a test or even after a test, like let's say it's like a three hour exam or something, like something huge, you feel like exhausted, right? If you didn't do sprints, you didn't work out or anything, you didn't do anything like that, you are just completely exhausted. If you've ever taken a test while they're training and you can tell, like, this is not going well. This is a bad deal. I should have eaten something. And that's basically what your brain is telling you is that your brain needs energy and needs carbs. And it spends energy while you are thinking. Okay. It really it legit does. And humans made, homo sapiens made the ultimate investment in the brain so that it could be something that could create, innovate, strategize, predict the future, things like that, things other species can't really do. That costs a lot of energy. To keep the brain running as big as our brain is, it takes about 30% of all the energy we consume. Compare that to other large mammals at 4%, and you can see that we made a naturally very, very big investment in this single organ and this single space. There are three main consequences of this, among others. Number one, obviously, we have to eat a lot, but eat a ton. The other is that if you injure a human brain, you probably lose the human, unfortunately. Not always the case with other mammals. Sometimes they can get away with a big head injury. You can. And childbirth. Unfortunately for Homo sapiens, bipedal primates, like us in this case, the childbirth process is difficult because of the size of the human head. Um, that's why you need to have an OBGYN team. Okay? That's why this process is not something that uh, can be done very easily. But luckily in modern medicine, we figured out quite a few strategies that can make it a lot better. But since maybe even a thousand years ago, this is not something that was a uh, not a sure thing at any, at any point. It's usually because it's not head that big. This is kind of just an interesting aside. Basically, when there are dinosaurs, mammals are the only like kind of warm blooded type thing, and then the bird cousins and such. If you're cold blooded and it's nighttime, you basically don't have as much energy. Your brain actually kind of shuts down a little bit. Warm blooded things like us that naturally have that negative or that uh, 37 degree set point, like we talked about last week. We have a constant flow of energy to our brain. It's always awake, it's always alive. You never have to depend on the environment. And it's theorized that that's the only way you can have an intelligent species, that it's not dependent on the environment, but instead, you can always fire out of the brain. So, in the context of the brain, and here's our neocortex, that's what makes us uh, us in a lot of cases, what you need in the brain is glucose. You can get glucose by breaking down carbs. You can get energy sources by breaking down fat and proteins in a lot of cases. But carbs are the main brain source of energy. So again, on the test example, eat like a bar or something before a test. Don't go in hungry because your brain is literally not having what it needs to work. And we'll see why it needs this energy to work. So this is another kind of interesting aside here. When you have your glucose stuff, so like sugar treats, ice cream, things like that, and you feel that reward system show up, that's because that is an ancient mammal reward system. Most of the time, because you were getting attacked by bees, or our ancestors were, or most mammals. So that is the most commonly found sugar out in the, uh, in the natural environment. Fruits too, but mainly because um, you, could, you wanted to consume all those really quickly in case other competitions showed up in that case. So that's why to this day we still really prize glucose. So one of the things that we have to kind of examine is that when we eat, we have to extract, you know, 99.9% .9 of all the glucose, all the carbs that we get. How do we defy 50 50 to do that? And this is where kind of some tricks kind of show up with, uh, oh shoot, I gotta go. Oh 
Oh no, Zoom disaster, get away. No. Oh no, no, no. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry about that, it took a little bit. Okay, so if we have a body system here, you have your intestine, but you want to get all of your glucose into the bloodstream, are you going to get 99.9% .9 of that into the bloodstream? So in blue, we're going to mark our glucose, and you do want that to cross over from what you ate into your bloodstream so you can digest it and ultimately send it to your brain. Importantly, though, you do not want other crap getting in your, into your bloodstream. This is actually how you get a lot of diseases like celiac, for example. If a piece of like gluten can get into your bloodstream, sometimes your immune system reacts badly to that. So how can you figure this out? And what is the system that they employ? And they use transport, and they actually don't use active transport here. So in yellow, these are tight junctions. These are basically just staples between cells. You don't even know that for this class. I'm just going to show this example. The junctions make sure that all the green stuff, all the other stuff that you from eating does not get in. Your blood that you don't want it there. So what your intestine cells have are in blue here. These are glucose facilitated diffusers, but they only allow it in. It is a one-way trip. They cannot get out in this case. Now you have a bunch of glucose in the cell. You have a second facilitated diffusion receptor. This is a glucose exit receptor. Meanwhile, no energy is getting sent. And the glucose that you did put in is now exiting all the way out of the cell. So basically, it turns the cell into a highway. You never need to actually pump anything in that case. You can actually get away with doing 50 50 in this case if you do it so quickly, it can't go away. So, all that's happening here is showing you that the kind of the final tool of these tight junctions, too, is to not allow the in and exit receptors to like, get away from the direction. So basically, the intestine cells serve as kind of a like transport highway that you can get your glucose from. Oh, oh. All right. Oh, sorry, I got a chat. You get a little chocolate. Okay. Yeah. All right. You will go here. All right. This is kind of the overview of what we saw. So again, from an advanced cell bio class, don't worry, it's all the glucose that you can manipulate the transporter process to get glucose through your blood, or sorry, in, from, your, from your gut into your blood. And so the whole point is to get that glucose to the brain, and we'll see why you need all that energy. So I think we've seen this all before. Sodium potassium pump. All right, you know, almost as, as common as like mitochondria, right? The whole point of this, of getting all that glucose into your brain is so that it can power this pump and pump out sodium outside your neurons, outside your brain cells. You want all the sodium, 99.9% .9 of it, outside the brain cells. And it has to use AD, ATP in this case to do it. And the place that you get ATP from by burning glucose in the mitochondria. You don't need no mitochondria, you just need to know glucose is going to lead to active transport ATP in this case. So the whole, the whole point of getting glucose to the brain is to power transporters like this that get sodium outside the cell. Right. And why go to all that trouble? And the reason is is that you want to push all the sodium outside the cell because that's actually going to charge the outside of your cell. So anytime, including for lab three, whenever you're looking at charges, and usually in the body, follow sodium. Wherever the sodium goes, the positive charge goes. That's something you'll see a lot of the time whenever you're doing any measurement of any kind. Now the reason why behind this is that you're pumping three sodiums out for every two potassiums you're pumping, so you're gaining a little bit of ionic charge each time. So what the pump has done, basically, and all of your neurons look like this, they're all ready to fire at a moment's notice. They have to be. And the force that you've created with 
sodium actually relates, I think, to one of the guiding questions. What is the force exerted by an electrochemical gradient? You'll see electrochemical gradient on any stamp. So we can break down two things that make what we're looking at an electrochemical gradient. Number one, there is a massive number and force of sodiums out here, and they're literally just trying to get inside the cell. They are pushing to get inside the cell because 99% of them are outside the cell, and they're trying to go down the concentration gradient. The cell membrane doesn't allow them to get inside. So there's just a massive physical force pushing up against the neuron of sodium trying to get in. That is the chemical force of an electrochemical gradient. That's where some of this energy that you've built up is actually being used. The second force seen here in the charge. There's a massive positive charge that exists outside the cell now, and all those sodiums now have come outside and they're positive. The inside of the cell is now negatively charged, and the sodiums that are positive want to rush in and meet that negative charge. Positive want to go negative in thermodynamics, biology, anything you see. So not only are there just you know countless amounts of these neurons or these ions trying to get in, they're actually just physically attracted or magnetically attracted almost to the positive or to the negative. Positive sodium ions are trying their best to get in there. And those are the two forces. So anytime you see on an exam the electrochemical gradient, those are the two things that are causing that much power to be ready to fire. Okay. So why go all this trouble? Why have that force? All of your neurons need to be able to ready to fire at any moment. During a test, you fire a lot more neurons. That's why you get exhausted because your brain is pushing the sodium in and out all, all the time. What will happen and what we'll see in lab three is that when a neuron gets the signal to fire, let's say, gets the signal to activate, the sodium outside will rush in. That will actually cause a positive charge inside the cell in here. Sorry, I can't draw it in there. That will cause more sodium down the line to rush in and sequentially it will keep firing down this axon, as it's called. And this is, whenever you see an animation, this is like the little spark that is firing down a neuron. What that is, is literally the ionic electrical force buzzing through the ion. And when it gets to the end here, the neuron will connect with other neurons. It may release neurotransmitters. But either way, the thought or the action or whatever you're doing completes. So the whole way to get from receiving information on this end to relaying information on this end is to fire in sodium. And the sodium always has to be ready. And we'll see why it's not, and when it's not, that's why you actually get dizzy, foggy, all over the place, right? So the need for glucose was to establish this gradient. And these neurons always need to be ready to go. They always need to be ready to be accessed, anything like that. The more you use, use certain parts of your brain, the stronger they get, for example, the stronger memories are going to have better connections, things like that. But in a lot of cases, the brain always needs to be ready to fire. That's why it's always burning glucose. So what this diagram kind of tries to show is that individual neurons kind of collect into what we call circuits, really closely connected partners that kind of form small bundles. The real connections start happening in the real life, knowledge, wisdom, experience, memories, all that is when circuits connect to other circuits. And that's only represented here by arrows. But in the brain, it's a massive network of connections, all firing, say, sodium rushing inside the cell, all established by burning glucose to get it outside the cell. And your brain is a very quick. If I ask you right now, for example, everybody in the room can have their own, will have a unique experience when I ask you this question. Think of your favorite memory with your siblings. Go. And everybody's going to have a unique, different experience, and it fires immediately. That sodium firing connecting circuits, connecting patterns, and you remember that memory all of a sudden. 
Anybody know me, kid? Sorry, that was another demonstration. You don't have that memory. Those circuits aren't built. That's okay. And don't feel bad. I'm not calling you out. It's just, it's just, a, just, a, just an exercise. Okay. So, this also gives us kind of a clue on something very, very disruptive in science. Neurodegeneration. Why does this occur? We actually don't have all the answers why. What we do know is that when regions and connections lose their ability to regulate sodium outside, let's say the water in that region of the brain dries up or there's a traumatic injury of some kind, the sodium can no longer exist outside those neurons well, those neurons will no longer fire. This can be due to proteins accumulating, injuries like I said, plaque. The result is usually something similar like this, basically a dehydration of the brain. And those sodium ions need water around to be able to float inside the brain and do well. So if you disturb this gradient, it's not going to be a good time, unfortunately. And we don't have the tools to renew areas that have been disturbed. And that's, that's another problem that we're trying to solve. OK. So like I said, I do want to cover everything Penny covered. So Got a bit long, so just take two minutes here and uh, just take a break. Like I said, like I showed here, the brain actually like, renews itself and gets ready again with the brain. So you get two minutes and then we'll, uh, we'll finish up. Over. Just reply to an email. You have no idea how many emails you get as a professor. It's just ridiculous. I wish I had like an AI chat on it. So I could answer That's kind of bad, though. It's kind of decent. Okay. All right. So you can also kind of keep going again. Look at these. Get that. It's come up and get worse. That's a possibility too. So take note of that. Or if you found something that was a little more confounding. These are lists updated pretty much until your exams all the time. I'm not 100% sure. Is the, are the lecture finals cumulative in this class? Is it like the whole thing all at once, or is it just like two questions? I think there's some. Okay, that's good, yeah. And that's a long time to, to remember. So, all right. So we'll come back to this in the final part, and then we'll
go from there. But yeah, kind of updated if you see anything it's good. Okay. So osmosis, osmolarity, hooray. This is how basically water is going to move in the presence of solutes as it relates to cells. Um, I had a terrible experience with this in undergrad, so I'm going to try and make this as simple as possible for everybody. Whenever you have a question of where water is going to go, it is going to follow the sodium. It is going to go attack the sodium or whatever solute you are looking at. If there is glucose, for example, outside the cell with sodium, like in this, in this hypertonic solution, and it's very high glucose, hence the hypertonic, the water will leave the cell and go attack the glucose to try and basically hydrate it, essentially. So anytime you have a ton of stuff outside the cell, water will rush out and meet that stuff. And those of you in healthcare, you'll start to see the Latin show up so many times. Hyper, that means a lot. Hypo, on the other hand, is going to mean a little. And notice that they are saying hypotonic solution in this case. Anytime you're talking solution, that's the surrounding environment, okay? I'll do an arrow. That is the surrounding environment. Now, question could be tricky and say a hypotonic solution in the cell. I think that's unfair. Hopefully, that doesn't show up. I don't think it will. But take note whenever it's describing which environment it's describing. But that cell is solution. Most everything you see should be solution. So that's like a fair way to do it. So in this case, if you put a blood cell here in a solution where there's very low salt, let's say, or low glucose, and the cell itself has a ton of glucose inside of it, the water from outside the cell will rush in to try and get that solute. And unfortunately for the cell, it's going to blow up probably. You'll see that over there, and you take a look at the blood over there. It's actually in a low salt solution, and you'll see that there's not much left in that tube. The reason behind that is that they all blow up immediately when I put that in. And I think in a normal circumstance, we'd actually be able to look at that blood. And I am so unfortunately, but obviously, probably that's not going to be a good idea. Okay. So this is a again fun morbid example. This is super this is super common in human fish. So one way you can look at this is a, basically what happened a lot of the times when uh, sailors would get their ship sunk and World War II in the Pacific. In a lot of cases, you would hang out for about two days in the life staff and you're not doing too well, you're getting really thirsty, and then everybody starts getting eaten by sharks. That's not a good time. Some people decided, I'm just going to drink salt water. And immediately when you drink salt water, you're dehydrated and almost die. It's like, it's like that. The reason is, that when you ingest that much salt, so it's in your gut and in your intestines and stuff, all that salt causes all the water in your body cells. What's left of it to rush out to use the salt when you just ingest it, and your body cells just basically shrivel up and they're dead. They lose all their function. That's in that case why you don't want to put salt water or be in salt water. So, kind of nasty. So, oh, I can lie down now. So, looking at what we looked at, even to the brain, though. Today you kind of look at it as a dietary thing, like, oh no, it's not salt. In the wild, it's still probably one of the rarest resources that you know, the animal kind of, or animals have to look for, specifically warm blooded mammals. Again, they have their brain firing all the time, and they basically have sodium ready to go all the time. So, as you can see, the lion up here, she found salt. Um, I'm from Colorado originally, and mountain lions are kind of a thing there. Just an interesting aside is that the problem is when a mountain lion attacks or got to get eat part of the human. You actually have to go find that animal and basically remove it, unfortunately, because humans that we exist now are probably the saltiest thing on the planet. And animals would never forget something that salty, basically. So they'll keep hunting you. That's why you see in certain cases tigers that have killed, let's say, someone that they murdered hundreds, hundreds of 200 people. They didn't forget how salty humans were, basically. And to this day, pretty much most animals are pretty, pretty addicted to salt because it is key for their brain. And Another fun story about animals. We domesticated them. They didn't need us for water. They didn't need us for food. So people always wondered why we could domesticate these things that we're so good at providing without us. Without the salt, so and so 
camels were like, well, we can hang around these things as long as they keep giving us salt. But we've all felt these effects at some point or another. Everybody has had a whole team on a to be sure I found McDonald's and felt like, oh my God, I feel terrible. I feel bloated. What's happening is that all that salt in your stomach is drawing out the water from your cells. The solution that you've made your gut into is hypertonic in that case. It's going to dry everything out. Now, on the flip side, though, this is why salt is so important. This is why, for example, you have to renew it with things like a Gatorade, for example, if you're out in the sun for like, you know, hours at a time. If you're low on salt, let's say you pile, why are you fainting and dizzy and stuff? Because brain circuits, like we talked about, rely on sodium to fire. And if they stop firing properly, it will start to become foggy and not all the way there anymore. So the reason behind that is that humans have the adaptability or adaptation to sweat. What that is is that your sweat force pushes sodium out. Sodium draws water. Remember, golden rule. Water is going to follow the sodium. Our sweat force pushes sodium out. Water follows it. You cool down. But eventually, that kind of runs out. You run out of sodium. So in this case, yeah, it's not a good time to be low on salt. As bad as it is to have too much salt. Too much salt, you can flush that out. In the case of muscles too, this is why you start to have like cramps, your muscles don't work, you start to be like not hit the right chest and really tired if you are doing something athletic. It's because the neurons that communicate with your muscles to tell it to fire, they're still relying on, on sodium and if they don't have enough, they're not going to fire. And you're going to start to miss that, you're not going to have the same coordination, everything. So we'll get to see muscles, I think, in one of the other labs. And the way they work is they actually have a source of calcium ready to go for them to buy it. So it's a little different system, same rules now. Okay, so we're going to work out. Uh, I'm just going to do one of the examples on your sheet in the conversion. Um, so kind of the yeah, chemistry, uh, unfortunately, does does play a role in a lot of these uh, in a lot of healthcare fields, for better or for worse. These are some chemotherapy drugs that I work with. Luckily, I don't have to administer them, but if I did. You will have certain, you know, machines, instruments that can help you with this. But does it really hurt to not to be able to see something that's a little out of whack, maybe? Like, if you see a result on the machine, maybe something you can find through some other band solution, and it doesn't look quite right, you'll have the tools to figure out if it is. And that's, that's very important because a lot of medical mistakes, which do account, like I, like I said, about a quarter million people a year in the U.S., a lot of the time it's because of misdoses. Don't neglect some of this stuff, especially when you can you can definitely uh, have a good effect with it. Okay, so I'm gonna transition over to the dot cam over here. I should be able to share everything here. Okay, I think we're good. Yeah. All right. So everybody does chemistry conversions a little differently. I'm gonna do it step by step, and we'll do it all at once. And I, I use what's called a table method, I think. I think most of you are familiar maybe with it. So let's see. You don't have to use this method to get the right answers, especially for an exam. Use whatever works best for you. Okay. So this is the one, this is the one on your sheet that is one below the worked out example. So through this, I'm going to try and kind of show you the step-by-step -step conversion. We will go step-by-step -step again. And now we're going to kind of explain why each step is, you know, why it's necessary, what are the special components of that step. I think anything you see on the test will only involve these translations. And that's really what conversions are, is translations from different mathematical languages and chemistry. So, take a look. Okay. So ultimately, we want something called osmolarity so we can compare it to we are starting with this three grams of salt in this case that is in one deciliter. And the one deciliter is one tenth of a liter. There's, there's ten deciliters in a liter. What you can do with the table method is send equal notation above and keep the new notations below in this case. So What's going to happen here for this conversion? And obviously, you can do this in your head, but that's the reason I'm showing you this step by step. When you start with deciliters, you can make a new conversion over here. This is an equal amount every time. Anytime you're converting stuff, remember, you're never adding or subtracting more salt or anything. You're just changing the volumes you're looking at, you're changing the 
moles as we get there, things like that. So these two amounts are completely equal. All we're doing in this case is going from the language of deciliters to the language of liters in this case. With any time with the table method, anything that's on top is multiplied together. That full number is going to be divided by each successive number on the bottom. So in this case, to fill out this table, all it would be is 3 times 10. That's going to equal 30. This can be divided by 1 over here. But again, that's the number. Anytime you see 1, you don't really have to do anything. And then 30 divided by 1 again here. So what that's going to equal now is that I still am talking in grams, which is mass, and I'm now converted to liters from deciliters. You can always write one liter or one or whatever you're doing. So you don't, like I said, you don't have to write one. I'm just going to write one to be step by step consistent, just going like that. So all we pretty much did was just convert up. We're in a new volume. So since we're 10 times the volume, we have 10 times the amount that we started with. So that's all we really did in that step. All right, the next one is the really important one. Okay. So this is going to answer, this is kind of about question 13. Why do we have to convert to moles from mass, right? The big reason is, is that moles is a number of molecules. And if you want concentration, which is what you want in a human system, because your bloodstream is concentrated with certain stuff, you want the number of molecules in the volume. Mass doesn't tell you how many numbers of sodium you have, not necessarily, just how heavy it is, basically. So a mole is that big, gigantic number, 10 to the 23rd, that's how many molecules of a substance, and this can change for sodium, it can change for glucose, how many of those equal the molecular weight in grams? So how many number of molecules of sodium are you so, on the little so. so that's all moles really are. It's a set number, and then by converting to a mole, you can actually convert to a proportional amount. You can actually look at number of molecules that are Clogging the solution. How thick is this solution? And the real key step is so if you even if the abstract chemistry doesn't doesn't gel quite yet, all you need to know is that moles kind of work for you as a translation between grams, which is mass, and concentration, which is where a lot of our things go. Okay. So in the case of Sodium, and this, these numbers will always be provided for you. This is the molecular weight of sodium, 58 and a half grams. That is equal to one mole of sodium. And that number is always going to be provided, so don't worry about ever like needing that or anything. So what we're doing here, and remember, so anytime you're converting the like number, it has to go as a like conversion. So it's opposite end, and then you make an equal box. So in this case, now, we converted from grams to moles. And remember, we didn't toss in any more salt. We didn't change any of the amount that we're doing. It's all the same still. We're just talking number of molecules instead of weight of molecules for now. So in this case, oh, come on. There we go. Okay. All you do in this case, 30 times 1. That's the 30 still. Nothing, nothing. Crazy there. Anytime you don't have, anytime you just have just a liter next to it or a notation, it's just one. So again, divide by one right there, 30. But now divide by this half. Okay. So now what we have is this number. I'm going to round up right there. Okay. okay. We are on our way. Concentration. Actually, we are. This is now concentration. So before, that is technically concentration of the mass of stuff in a volume, but this is a much better measurement of how thick is this box, basically. What level, what number of molecules are outside? Remember, that's going to be the, the transition that we make to see where the water rushes to. And then, as an aside, you'll see this in like more chemistry classes. This is something called molarity. This is 
just mold over leaders. Um, you don't need it for this class, I'm pretty sure, but it's still standing them. So I'll just highlighting that. So mold in a leader. Okay. And, it, and again, like I said, um, you know, this, this lab isn't like one of the longer ones, but I'll be here the whole three hours you guys need to stay. You can go over this as many times as you need to stay. All right. So moving on to the next step, we are working with our mold for leader. Now we get to add in a step that covers something special about water, and that's osmol. They sound a little weird, but luckily they're not like a serious thing. So in the case of sodium chloride, one mole, so again, we're going to go here, one mole of this molecule is two osmoles in water. Now, why did we just suddenly double that? Why is sodium chloride in two osmoles when you put into water? Because unlike things that are covalently bound, like CO2 or H2O, those have really strong bonds. They're not going to break apart in water. When you have a plus minus ionic bond, this is pretty tenuous, I'd say. Like these two do not, like they're staying together just because of the positive charge negative charge. That's the only reason. So when you put this into water, all the water molecules around here will basically break these two apart. Because water is in its unique properties with light, it has small positive charges and small negative charges. So the small water negative charges can surround the sodium, the small water positive charges What happens when you put an ionic solution in the water is that it's going to break apart. And now where there was one molecule, you have two. Anytime you toss charged molecules in the water, they're going to break up. Now, just for a second, we'll take a slow three. We'll come back to R1, R right here. When you're looking at glucose, though, and that is one of your examples on the problem set, glucose is just a big carbon chain molecule. You know, it's like a bunch of like these hexagons, these big carbon things that get broken down for energy. These are all really strong covalent bonds. Nothing's going to break those apart. Water doesn't, can't do that. There's no, you know, there's no like this magnetic, like we're just attracted to each other because we're opposites here. These are literally sharing the electrons. It's not going to break apart water. So one mole of glucose, so let's call it G, equals one osmol of glucose. So all you're looking at in osmol is how many pieces is this going to fracture into when it hits the water. That's it. I know this is taking a little longer than the usual pre-lab period, but this is something that was like pretty explicit. So, once you know kind of this concept behind why osmolarity is a thing, why these little osmoles are, you can convert the language of moles to osmoles in this case. And all this is going to do is put us at 1.26 osmol over liters. So this number times 2 divided by 1 divided by 1, nothing else. That's osmol's method to be whenever you're looking at drugs, anything that is dissolved in the water. Some drugs do break into pieces, and they have actionable consequences in public health. So that's the reason why it's, it's very like very important. If you send in the wrong, if you don't account for how the drug's going to break up in the body, you may overdose or underdose stuff like that. Remember, osmoles, this is still like moles. It's basically, like I said, how many numbers of molecules, how thick of a concentration are we looking at? So now all you're going to do is use the metric system to get the milliosmoles, because that's the question after. Remember, milli is 
thousand times smaller. So that means that one osmol is equal to a thousand milli osmol. See that little milli there now. I'll fly here to here. You can put over liter here. One thing I've noticed that if you don't see something that says over liter, like it just gives you an osmolarity or a mold or something, assume it's over a liter because that information is not given. Okay. Last bit. So the question asks you what's going to happen if this is the solution that you have a cell in. Here's our cell. It has 300 milliosmol of sodium chloride. So this number is thickness or concentration and number of salt molecules inside the cell. This is the number and thickness, basically, of salt molecules outside the cell. And as you can tell, this is about three times bigger, a little bit change. So what I can note that is, I'll draw these in orange. So here's your little sodium inside your cell. There's a few of them, that's fine. But there's tons outside the cell. It's three times the amount, right? So it's really way more concentrated than the inside of the cell. Is. That's not a few scale measurement, but as you can tell. So where does water go? It goes towards wherever the cell is. There's more solute outside this cell. And the water that is inside the cell is going to go out and meet it. This is where all your H2O is now going to flood outside from the cell badly. Because it's going to try and meet the higher amount of salt. As a result, this cell is going to shrink. Because this solution it has more solute hypertonic. All right. One last fold, and this is how you actually have to answer one and two. There's one last, again, language saying that I probably wouldn't put in a test, but it's in yours, so be careful. In some of the exams, they're going to ask you where now is the higher water concentration in this system. We know that there's a higher solute concentration outside compared to inside the cell. Water concentration is always opposite of the solute concentration. That's just, that's just the rule, basically. It basically means that there's more solute taking up room than there is water. So solute concentration is inverse the water concentration every time. Now, if you're like me, you may have to just find out what the solute concentration is, then say what the H2O one is. So I have to work it out step by step in my head usually. So in this case, because the solution has a much higher Amount of salt, that means it has a lower water concentration. And this is the notation for concentration right here, these little brackets. Um, you may see those in more chemistry classes. Or in doses and things like that. So, Super fun stuff, right? But this is super important, especially if you work in an emergency rotation, something like that. You've got to make a call on how much you know, of a certain solution you're going to give somebody, depending on what you need, things like that. And I mean, also in non emergency situations, you should be pretty sure about what you're giving everybody. Okay. So that's the full thing. That was step by step. There is a quicker way to do it if you feel good about it. So we're just going to do that now. You can follow along if you want. Or 
either way with conversions. You can go step by step, or you can do the whole thing at once, like I'm going to try. All right. So we start again with what we started at three grams of salt, one deciliter. There are 10 deciliters in one liter. There are 68 and a half grams of salt. Remember, this is NA specific, NACL specific molecular weight in one mole. So, no more grams. In one mole of uh, sodium chloride, you have two odd moles. And this is because salt splits the chloride. And it becomes two. In one osmol, you have a thousand milli osmol. That's the metric system. Okay. So if you feel pretty good about doing these just like this, then use that system. If you have another system that you use, if you want to do a step by step, use that. Personally, the way I learned it was I did the step by step until I was confident enough to do the full thing like this. Um, but some of your brains may work to just do the full thing all at once, and that's easier because then you actually have everything right in front of you. So, start on the top, multiply everything by everything, then we'll divide by each single number after we get that big top amount. Okay. So, 3 times 10 times 1 times 2 times 1,000. Okay. We have the full top side all set up here. Now we just have to divide by every number down here sequentially. So divided by one, divided by one, divided by 50 and a half, divided by one, divided by one, and this is your answer right here. 1,026. And we convert to moles, convert to osmoles. We are at many, many osmoles. Hopefully, once you master the ability to jump between these different languages using the conversion, anything that is thrown at you on the exam is totally handleable. Handleable. Goal. That's not a word, sorry. Don't write that as an answer. Um, basically, it's kind of like remember how you, when you learn how to drive, the car feels like it's in control of the situation. When you, but when you really learn how to drive, you find out that you're in control of the car. The equations are very similar to that, they work for you. They're there to make this. They do not control your stress, things like that. Don't let them become the, basically the issue. Get comfortable as possible as you can with them. There are great quizlets, things like that, that will like drill you on stuff like this. And Penny should have some good practice stuff up too. So that's going to be somewhere to turn. And if you need something for practice, always come to me too if you want. All right. Okay. So last thing. That's one. Okay. So, I think you guys have seen this before, probably pull everywhere, I'm sure. Um, this is the final stage of that, those guiding questions. So now, after everything's done now, we'll cover the top three really quick, and then you're off to the races with lab, I'll do a quick expo on that. But now is a good chance for you both to decide, like, you want me to cover something explicitly right now. Is there anything that you highlighted and say, like, I'm not all the way here yet, if you want that gap filled, you can do that right now. So we'll do the best one, uh, the top three that you get both on. So scan those guiding questions, too, if you don't feel good on, you can send these in if you want. And if you're feeling pretty good, you can just kind of hang out and have phone time. Yeah, and everybody on Zoom, I think, can see this, but you can vote too, so that's good.
know. Yeah, we're perfect on the exam. This is good. We got no, we have no questions on that for any set. That's right. Is that is technically possible. I appreciate, oh yeah, you also have unlimited votes. You can put in like five things if you want. All right. I, yeah, I'll give this. Yeah, we'll give this like 50 seconds. But if everybody's feeling pretty good, we'll uh, get going. That's okay. The main one from the other class was were 13, 11, 5, and 4. And not this one. Yeah, those were the main ones. Mainly some of those pure chemistry ones. Incidentally. When I get the feedback from Wednesday and Tuesday, I actually incorporate that into today. So maybe that actually works then. I didn't have a question about that, but I'm curious. All right. Okay, we are good. This is, oh, I do have a chat. Okay. Phone swap area 5 and 11. Um, let's see, five, eleven courses. Okay. Yeah, so we can just do this quick. So. Yep. so five, what is the force that is acting? Just like we saw. The force on a neuron that you push thousands of times more sodium onto this side. And they're literally just trying to push in. So there's that physical push. And the other, because tons of these positive molecules now want to get inside this cell because it's negatively charged because it lost all the sodium ions. So they are trying to push in. The way that a neuron fires is that it gets the go-ahead to let them in. That's what we'll see next. So once you get some stimulus up here, and that's usually another neuron firing or something, or one of your sensory cells telling you to fire, or you thinking of a memory, things like that, that is going to trigger. Basically, we have these big sodium channels that exist on the side of neurons. That's what is going to allow the sodium to enter in. They're actually going to go right through those. And that's down the line that fires, and then you can fire neurotransmitters or just more uh, action central signal. Um, the word action central is super cool, sounds neat. Um, don't let it intimidate you or anything though, it's just basically sodium flowing into the cell, that's it, sequentially. Okay, then I think 11 was asked, osmosis, concentration, yeah. So 11 is good, it's basically, this is more just, um, I need to kind of talk out 11. So 11 is the way that you can translate different molecules basically because moles, a mole of glucose is the same number of molecules as a mole of salt, for example. But the masses are different. And you can't compare things based on different masses because things have different chemical structures. Glucose is way heavier than salt, for example. So that's not always going to translate super well. That's the whole utility of the mole, that you can turn any chemical concentration into what number of molecules would really exist. You try to do how much mass is in here, it's always going to be different depending on the chemical you're looking at. The moles are a very good system to unify every chemical translation you can possibly do. Watch out. Yeah, phone one popping. Back to channel 11. Okay, cool. All right, well, I think that we are good then, right? Let's see what we can do here. 
All right, we are all set. Room PC, good, there we are. So, for the lab today, um, just a couple of reminders. So, okay, so I'm gonna put you in breakout rooms like usual, right? And nobody panic when the breakout rooms happen. I have somebody go into a room and their person has logged on and sits there with just like the Zoom chat. Help, in all capitals. You don't need to have that happen, just relax, you'll be okay. Um, include your Zoom partners, and likewise, if you're on Zoom, do your best to participate. Kind of come up with a plan of who's going to tackle what. Like for example, like the Zoom person can start working on the conversions and explaining them to live people, for example. The live people do have two different exercises up here that you can take a look at. You have the blood that is in a specific salt solution. Some of those blood cells burst, some of those shrink, and some stay the same. You'll get to look at those. And then up here in the front are the little like the thistles, quote unquote. They're basically just little like plastic membrane bubbles that allow water in and out, but not glucose. So based on the measurements of what you see here, you're going to be able to see if water was gained or lost in these little bubbles. And based on that, you're going to predict is the sugar inside the bubble or is the sugar outside in the solution. And then these are also really good practice to start practicing, you know, hypertonic solution, hypertonic solution. And not only that, once you figure out where the solute is in each of the bubbles, also reverse that and decide where is the actual higher water concentration. Remember, that's the inverse of wherever the solute is. High solute, wherever you find that glucose is, means that there's lower water concentration there. And that's what uh, questions number one and two kind of ask you. So try and get your, yeah, try and translate what you find and see in the live lab to your Zoom partner, try and be a cool teammate, and you know, kind of do your best on that. That realm. I think we had a couple too many in the last couple laps where either side kind of just logged out. So don't keep that, please. Um, other than that, I think we are all set, I believe. So I'll break everybody into Zoom rooms, log in, remember to do MSU, Zoom, like Google that, log in through that mechanism. We should be good in here, and most of you are probably already here. So, all right, we will break out, and that should be good. Yeah, let's do the live lab.